today we're going to start a number of lectures um, on <clears throat> two thinkers who reject the idea of persons and of personhood and of personal identity. Um, we're going to spend, to give, spend two lectures on each thinker. And what I want to do today is I just sort of want to set things up. I want to talk a little bit about the direction from which this line of critique comes. I want to give a little bit of background on the first of the two thinkers that we're going to be talking about and basically get us oriented so that we can dive right into the details next time. Now in order to, in order to set up this line of critique, it's important that we look back at what we've done so far <clears throat> in terms of the similarities of the, of the two thinkers we've already discussed rather than their differences. So we've talked about Rene Descartes' view of the self, of, the, of, of what a person is, and we talked about John Locke's views of, of personhood and personal identity. And at least while we were talking about them, we were, we, we were talking about their, them in terms of their differences. I emphasized the ways in which Locke's views are different from Descartes. Uh, for one thing, that Locke's views do not carry dualistic implications, whereas Descartes do. Uh, not do they don't only carry dualistic implications, they are explicitly dualistic. Uh, and, and moreover, last time I talked about <clears throat> what, how they come to these two, diff these two different views, how the, their in, the interest that they bring with them to the subject drive the direction uh, in, which, in which they go. But today I want to talk about the ways in which Locke and Descartes are similar, the ways in which they really belong to a single, uh, a single paradigm, a single, a single way of thinking about, <clears throat> about persons and about, about the self. In order to set up this, the line of critique that I'm, going to, that I'm going to talk about, that we're going to talk about for the next uh, few lectures. Because from the standpoint of the critics, Descartes and Locke commit essentially the same error. Um, the critics that I'm going to be, that I'm going to be discussing, um, their criticisms apply to Descartes and to Locke's views alike. And so we need to talk about the ways in which Descartes and Locke are similar in order to understand this particular line of critique, and it is a recent and powerful line of critique, one that, the one that cannot be ignored whether or not we ultimately accept it. <clears throat> the sense in which Descartes and Locke's views are similar is that they are both what I will call mentalistic. They are both mentalistic approaches to our identity and to our behavior. Now, what do I mean by mentalistic? What is, what is mentalism? Well, let's define it. I'm going to give, define it in terms of two, two ideas. So according to mentalism, first of all, our deliberate de behavior, that is, our, our, our voluntary actions, are the direct result of conscious mental states. That is, the mentalist thinks that the primary cause of a deliberate behavior is a conscious thought. Right? That's one aspect of mentalism. The second is that our identities as persons are comprised of these mental states. That is, we are to be identified by some set of our, con of our conscious thoughts, our beliefs, desires, attitudes, these, those conscious thoughts that make up what I'm going to also call the interior self. Descartes and Locke alike are mentalists in this sense. They both believe that what makes each person the person that he or she is, is their conscious state of mind, their interior self. And I, I call it the interior self because it's interior in the sense that the self is defined in terms of mental states that are inside uh, your mind. <clears throat> So Descartes and Locke are mentalists both in that they believe that, that personal identity is, is to, that, that, that personhood or the self is to be identified with the interior self, with these conscious mental states. 
And secondly, that it's these conscious mental states that are the, that, that are the direct proximate causes of our voluntary behavior. Notice that mind-body dualism, Cartesian dualism, is a type of mentalism. That is, mentalism is a sort of an umbrella position of which dualism is one type. Locke's theory, being non-dualistic, is another variety of mentalism. And there may be any number of mentalistic theories of persons, personal identity, and of, human, of, of, of behavior. There are a number of very important 20th century philosophers and scientists, uh, psychologists in particular, um, who are anti-mentalism, who oppose the mentalistic view both of persons and the mentalistic account of behavior, of our behavior. They believe, one, that the idea of the interior self is a myth, that there is no such thing, and two, that mentalism gives the wrong account of human behavior, that it, that it presents a false picture of the etiology of human behavior. <clears throat> so, these anti-mentalists, as I'll call them for, for the moment until we, until we give them a proper name, these anti-mentalists um, believe both that there is literally no such thing as the person or as the self as distinct from the human being. Right, so they're going to reject any sort of Cartesian idea that there is literally an entity that corresponds to self or person. But they also are anti-Lockians. They're going to deny that the, very, that the concept of a person or of a self as distinct from the concept of a human being has any useful explanatory role to play whatsoever in accounting for our behavior or for anything else for that matter. One of the thinkers we're going to talk about, the second of the, of, of the thinkers we're going to talk about, B.F. Skinner, denies specifically the role in moral and legal affairs that Locke wants to assign the concept of a person. Indeed, uh, the book that we're going to read by B.F. Skinner is called, uh, is, is entitled Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And Skinner believes that our basic moral and legal notions are as fictional as the conception of a self. Indeed, that these are all sort of a family of fictions that arose up together and that a truly scientific view of human nature uh, and of human behavior is going to sweep all of that away. Both Ryle and Skinner um, belong to a school of thought, and I call it a school, but that, that, don't, don't get the impression that this is a, 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 an actual group of people. It's rather a, a way of thinking about uh, human nature and human behavior uh, that these people have in common. They belong to the school of thought that's known as behaviorism. Uh, and of course there is a school of psychological thought that, that carries this name, a very influential one. Behaviorism is a direct counterpart, an opponent to, an alternative to, if you will, uh, mentalism. And so just as we define mentalism, let's go ahead and define behaviorism. And I'm defining behaviorism in the sense that, that it's going to be used in uh, this course. Uh, if you were to take a psychology course where you were learning the history of th theories, psychological theories, um, the definition for behaviorism that you would get would be related, but would be undoubtedly somewhat different from the one that I'm going to give. The one that I'm giving includes not only, strictly speaking, psychological theories, but also philosophical theories like Ryle's. Okay, so, so, so I'm going to define behaviorism as the word will be used in this course. And I'm also going to define it in terms of two ideas, the same way I did for mentalism. Behaviorists, uh, first of all, think that all of our behavior is the result of environmental, not mental causes. That is, the direct, um, the, the proximate, immediate cause of a behavior is not some mental state, some thought, but rather an environmental cause. Secondly, there is no interior self, no such thing as personhood distinct from our biological humanity, either as a matter of fact or as a matter of description. In other words, 
There literally is no self or person in addition to human being. And there is no useful purpose to having, in other words, no useful explanatory purpose is served by having an, a concept of persons. Right? So this is not only a rejection of Descartes, it's a rejection of Locke. It's a rejection even of the idea that it is useful to speak of individuals under both the description human being and the description person. What the behavior says is there is no useful explanatory role to be played by persons or by the mental states, the conscious states, that are thought to be the essence of persons. Okay. To illustrate the differences between the mentalistic and the behavioristic view, let's take a very simple example. So I'm going to um, give an example of a behavior, and I'm going to offer two different accounts of the behavior. The first will be a mentalistic account, the second will be a behaviorist account, in order to get a sense of the differences between these two views. So let's take a very simple example of a behavior. The behavior in question is, John drinks a glass of water. Okay. Now here, is the, here would be the mentalistic account. Okay. We'd go something like this. John drank a glass of water which is the behavior, because he was thirsty, which is, of course, a mental state. In other words, because he had a certain mental state, the mental state of being thirsty, that caused him to engage in a certain behavior, to drink a glass of water. That is a mentalistic explanation of a behavior. Now, here would be the behaviorist account of the same behavior. John drank a glass of water, the behavior, because he had been working out in the hot sun, which of course is an environmental cause. So in this case, notice there's no mention of a mental state, there's no mention of a thought, there's no mention of any internal process. What we're told is, John was outside working in the hot sun, this caused him to then drink a glass of water. That would be a behaviorist explanation of the behavior. Now, as I, as, I, as I indicated, we're going to discuss the views of two influential behaviorists. Um, the first is the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, uh, who produced one of the most famous critiques, not only of Cartesian dualism, but of all forms of mentalistic explanation. In other words, Ra's critique strikes not only against dualistic views of mind and body, but, sp but strikes against any mentalistic account of human nature and human activity. The second person we're going to read, whose views we're going to examine, is the psychologist B.F. Skinner, who of course is one of the founders of the behaviorist school in psychology, and was an outspoken, this is the interesting part, Skinner was an outspoken proponent of a radical reconfiguration of our moral, social, and political forms of life along behaviorist lines. Skinner argued passionately, both in writing and in speech, for a scientific re-engineering of society. His most famous, he wrote the most famous two books uh, of advocacy in this regard are the books Beyond Freedom and Dignity and the book Walden II. Right. Uh, and, I, and I highly recommend these. We will read parts of Beyond Freedom and Dignity in this class. We will not, we will not read um, Walden II. Um, but, but Skinner was a classic example of a social engineer, that is a person who thought, uh, as an individual who thought that um, that society needed to be completely reconfigured along scientifically respectable, line, respectable lines, that in a sense our social development was is, has been retarded by the fact that we, that we have not yet brought the, sci the sciences to bear upon the management of human life, even while we have brought the sciences to bear on the management of every other, uh, other aspect of life. So today what I'm going to do, for the, rest of, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to um, give a little introduction to Ryle and talk about the intellectual context out of which he's coming and the basic idea that he's bringing to this question of, of, uh, of self, person, personal identity, uh, and, and more generally the sort of the mentalist idea, uh, the mentalist view of human nature and behavior. Um, and then next time, we'll get into the details of Ryle's view, and then after that, we'll move on to B.F. Skinner. 
So let me say a few things about Gilbert Ryle. He was born in 1900 and died in 1976. Uh, Ryle was an intelligence officer during the Second World War. Uh, he was the Wainfleet Professor of Philosophy at Oxford University, a very distinguished uh, position, a named chair. Uh, I believe the Wainfleet Lectures, the, the lectures named after that uh, chair, still go on to this day, and it's, it's considered a great honor to be invited to give the Wainfleet Lectures. He was, uh, Ryle was for 25 years the editor of the journal Mind, which is the, arguably the top journal of philosophy in the world. Uh, I do believe, I want to say it is also the oldest journal of philosophy in the world, but I'm, I'm not absolutely certain about that. It is certainly one of the oldest. Um, he is also one of the founding members of what's called the Ordinary Language School of Philosophy. Um, again, when we talk of a school, we don't literally mean a, a school as in a, an institution with you know, people in it, but we mean a sort of a, a way of thinking that was shared by a number of people who did work together and worked on sort of, in sort of common projects towards a common end. Um, this, this school as, is called the Ordinary Language School, and um, Ryle was one of, 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 of the founding members of, of this distinctive way of doing philosophy, this distinctive, distinctive approach to philosophical subjects. So let me just say now a few words about the Ordinary Language School, because it will be very difficult to understand Ryle's critique of mentalism if we don't have a more general understanding of ordinary language philosophy and the sort of ideas, the, the, the notions and, and conceptions of critical analysis that come out of the ordinary language uh, school of philosophy. So let me talk a little bit about ordinary language philosophy now. It was a mid-20th century philosophical movement centered around Oxford University. That is, the ordinary language school, uh, ordinary language philosophy is sometimes referred to in the literature as Oxford philosophy. Now, today it's not often called that only because there have been so many other philosophical movements that have come out of that great ancient university. Um, but certainly in the mid 20th century, um, Oxford was most famous for this product, this, this school of thought. And, and at least um, um, the, the, word, the, the word Oxford philosophy indicates that. Um, the chief architects of the ordinary language school of thought were Gilbert Ryle, as already mentioned, and the philosopher J. L. Austin, who was born in 1911 and died in 1960. The overarching idea of ordinary language philosophy was that there are no genuine philosophical problems that philosophical problems arise because of confusions about language. Now, let me say that again. The overriding idea of ordinary language philosophy is that there are no genuine philosophical problems, but that rather philosophical problems arise out of confusions in language. Typically, the confusions are confusions of oversimplification. So the idea is something like this. Philosophers tend to address problems or dilemmas which have two sides. Right? So there's one position on the subject, another position on the subject, they're in opposition to each other, and the philosopher uh, is trying to solve the dilemma, to, to, break, the, the, to, break, the conf to break the confrontation. Ordin the ordinary language philosophers thought that, that this, 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 this paradigm of dilemmas, problems, paradoxes reflected a too simple view of language and its use. In other words, it's the result of treating words too simply. So to just, to take, to just take an example, um, one of the uh, great perennial philosophical subjects that goes back to ancient Greece, it's thousands of years old, is the question of the, nat the ultimate nature of reality. And this is a subject of which there are numerous sides, but there tend to be two gigantic titanic schools of thought in opposition to each other. On the one hand, you, would have, you have what are called the nominalists, who believe that reality ultimately consists of individual things. On the other side, you have what's generally called the Platonists, who believe that reality ultimately consists of 
abstract universals, of abstract ideas. Um, and these schools have been in, these, these two ways of thinking have been in conflict for millennia and are still in conflict to this day, incidentally. Um, when I was in graduate school, there was one very famous nominalist and one very famous Platonist who would battle on all sorts of issues. But now, the ordinary language philosophers would say that the entire struggle, the entire battle between these two sides stems from a, an overly simplistic conception of the, word, of, of the meaning of the word reality. The ordinary language philosopher might point out that the word, words reality and real are used in numerous different ways with different connotations. And that the idea that there is some sort of one single thing, reality, about which we could take one position or the other, uh, is at odds with what, 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 what we ordinarily mean when we use the word reality. That we use the word reality in many, many different ways, with many, many different senses, depending on the context. But what philosophers do is they kind of conflate all of these together, as if there's simply one word, reality, which has one meaning over which we can then have an argument. And ordinary language philosophers thought that virtually every philosophical problem arises from this kind of um, confusion over the meanings of words, this kind of oversimplification of the meanings of words, um, to quote, uh, oh, and, and, that, and that, that the way out of philosophical problems was, in a sense, to reacquaint ourselves with the multiplicity of ways in which words are used and to remind ourselves of that sort of that messy diversity of uses which makes the articulation of very simple black and white kinds of problems impossible. Um, and I'm going to quote now, there's a very short quote from J.L. Austin, who is one of the, who, as I said, is one of the founders of the Ordinary Language School from his book Sense and Sensibilia, which was actually published posthumously uh, on this very question, or on this very issue. Quote, so he's talking here about the general state of philosophy and the general mistake that philosophers make. Quote, the fact is that our ordinary words are much subtler in their uses and mark many more distinctions than philosophers have realized. It is essential to abandon the deeply ingrained worship of tidy-looking dichotomies, unquote. And that last statement is a direct jab at philosophy as it's been traditionally practiced. Philosophy has always been about tidy dichotomies, this way or that way, pro or con, for or against, black or white. And Austin's, what Austin wants to say is, if we are careful and examine the way that we actually use words, we'll realize that there is virtually no issue that breaks down this way. Now, Ryle blamed the mind-body problem precisely on this kind of linguistic confusion. Now, let me say what I mean by the mind-body problem. Um, because ordinary language philosophy was, 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 was concent concentrated on the dissolution, the dissolving of, of philosophical problems by way of a careful analysis of the way that we use certain words, um, Ryle is going to address the, the subject that we've been talking about in this part of the course, this issue of persons, self, persons, personal identity, uh, mentalism. He's going to address this from the perspective of a perennial philosophical problem. That problem is the mind-body problem, and it's a problem that, in a sense, arises um, out of, out of, out of uh, what Ryle thinks are our linguistic confusions having to do with um, the words that we employ to talk about uh, minds and bodies, to talk about persons and human beings and so on and so forth. The, so I'm gonna, just going to define the mind-body problem um, as that cluster of problems which arise from a dualistic view of mind and body, i.e. the problem of mental physical causation, the problem of other minds, etc. Okay. But we have to be aware that as we read Ryle's critique, as we go through Ryle's critique, we're going to see that its implications carry far beyond merely the dualistic uh, version of mentalism. That is, while Ryle takes himself to be addressing the mind-body problem, those cluster of problems that we talked about at the end of our discussion of Descartes that arise from the belief that mind and body consist of separate substances, as we will see, Ryle's critique is going to include 
all mentalistic conceptions of human nature and of human behavior. Okay. Specifically, just to give you a sort of a, a sort of a, a an advance notice of the general uh, the general tenor of Ryle's uh, of Ryle's critique. Ryle's critique is basically going to go as follows. He's going to say, "Look, we systematically miss we meaning philosophers." He doesn't think that ordinary people suffer from these mistakes, as ordinary people don't don't contemplate philosophical problems as a general rule. Um, it's philosophers who make this mistake. He's going to say, philosophers systematically misinterpret and misunderstand the role played by mentalistic words in ordinary speech. So, we're talking about words like believe, think, want, hope, hate. All these words that, that, that belong to what I'll call our mentalistic vocabulary, these words that ostensibly refer to mental states. Ryle says that philosophers systematically have misunderstood the way that these words are used, the role that they play in our writing and speech. And they have misunderstood them in such a way as to have engendered the illusion that these words actually indicate the existence of minds and thoughts as internal entities and processes. That is, it's because philosophers misunderstand the way mentalistic vocabulary functions in language that they have mistakenly concluded that there are such things as minds and thoughts. That once we understand the role that these words, that mentalistic words, really play in our writing and speech, we will no longer be tempted to think that there are minds or thoughts or any other internal mental processes. That is going to be, the, that's essentially the tenor, that, that, that's the logic of, of Ryle's critique. What we're going to do next time, and we're on next time now, next time we're going to go into the details. Okay, what is the mistake that philosophers have made with respect to mentalistic vocabulary? How has that mistake led to the mistaken belief that there are minds and thoughts? And moreover, what is the correct way of, of, of understanding our mentalist vocabulary? And what does the, that correct understanding indicate about minds, bodies, persons versus human beings? So next time we're going to go into the details of Ryle's critique. And let me leave you with two things to think about uh, while you're reading. First of all, what does Ryle mean by a category mistake? Ryle is going to accuse um, mentalists of committing a category mistake. Well, what does he mean by a category mistake? And in what sense is one's belief that one exists as a discrete self the result of a category mistake according to Ryle? So what is a category mistake and in what sense does the mentalist commit a category mistake? Two, is it plausible to you, and I mean you the reader, you the student, is it plausible to you that the very notion that you exist as a discrete self is simply the result of a confusion about language. Is it plausible to you, if you believe that you exist as a person, as distinct from you as a human being, is it plausible to you to suggest that that belief is the result of, a conf of confusions that you have about the meanings of mentalistic words? Those are the two things I want you to think about while you're reading. And we will pick this up again next time. Thank you very much. See you then.